Amen. Well, bless you guys as you give. As you guys are giving, I'm going to give you kind of a quick introduction to what is happening next tonight. I'm uh, super excited about this. Um, this guy that's going to be coming up here in just a few moments is somebody that I've known for many, many years. I know people can say that, but when I say that, like about this person, I, I mean, like, I've known him since, like, I was about this tall. So, like, yeah, we grew up together and have done a lot of things together in the past. Um, turned to Christ, um, cleaned our act up, and watched God clean us up. Uh, and then both got called into to doing ministry and just having a heart for people and a heart for the scriptures. And so uh, Pastor Tone, who's going to be coming up in a minute, Tony Bruno, he actually was one of the pastors at Crossover, the associate pastors from 2005 to 2008. Uh, he's been back several times since then to speak and do different things. And so uh, the last several years, he's actually been um, a teacher, a professor in a couple of different Bible colleges up in the Philadelphia area where he lives at now with his family. And so he's got this passion to talk about um, the biblical story, the narrative of the Bible. A lot of times we don't look at it um, as one story that weaves together. Maybe you've never looked at it like that, but tonight and tomorrow night and Friday night, he's really going to break that down for you guys. I'm super excited about sitting in on this and learning and, and growing and uh, being inspired in some new ways. And so uh, I think everybody's done. I think we're ready. Y'all ready? Okay, so Crossover family, come on. Give this guy some warm Crossover love. He's no stranger. He's part of our family. Give it up for Tony Bruno. Tone Bruno. Yeah. I'm on, but I'll say, I am? Yes, okay. Um, whatever the occasion, I'm always excited to be here. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. A big, big thank you to Pastor Tommy, uh, who permitted this, and the team, uh, you know, because when you get to a point of having a church this size, lots of people call in to want to come in and do lots of stuff. And when I, this was my idea. When I called in and put in the request that I could come and do this, pretty much immediately he said, I think we would love to do that. Let me run it by the team and got back to me soon and made it happen. So thank you so much for allowing me to do this. Uh, I am, as he mentioned, passionate about the stuff that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, I'm blessed to be able to do it for a living, uh, and it, it's so true that we are not used to hearing the Bible being taught as a holistic story, as a narrative, not that the way we've been looking at it is wrong, but it's not the only way to approach the Bible. Uh, and so I didn't learn what I'm going to teach to you tonight, which is really cut down, believe it or not. If you can imagine uh, Pastor Tommy taking a 40-minute message and trying to say the same thing down to six, mon six minutes is what I'm trying to do in these three nights. So I don't know if two hours a night is going to seem long for you, but I teach this four hours at a time for 10 weeks. So I've cut down that stuff for this three nights for two hours at a time. But anyway, um, when I begin to learn this stuff that I'll be relaying to you tonight, I was going for my master's degree, <clears throat> and as I was learning it and beginning to, it was sinking in, I had a similar experience that I had when I was in Bible college for my undergraduate degree, which was, as I'm learning this stuff, I begin to say to myself, and, and, and vision is just sort of beginning to develop, I'm saying, the church needs to know this stuff. I shouldn't have to pay tens of thousands of dollars to learn it, but if I have to, let at least others not have to do that. Um, so this is part of what excites me to be here. And just, just to try to um, avoid any kind of stereotype, so I come before you technically as a professor, but I hope nobody comes thinking, well, I hope I can understand this stuff. It's going to sound complicated. It's going to sound too high and uppity for me. Listen, the students I teach, as I begin to teach, I begin to learn, there were times I put up a PowerPoint and tell a student, read that for me, and they kind of couldn't. Okay, they come from a Philadelphia public education system, which is among the worst in the country. 
I, don't, I, I, I say that statistically. Uh, and so we are trying to give them an opportunity for a college education in different fields, but with the foundation of a biblical worldview, okay? Uh, so I'm trusting we're going to understand everything fine. Uh, if we don't, then my fault. I'll try to do better next time. Uh, but we're going to get this going. Uh, before we do, let's pray one more time. And if you could, okay, we're all set and ready to go. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I just want to one last time give this all over to you. May you own it. May you use me as your mouthpiece. Help me to be careful to not say anything that you don't want said or that is not right. And I do pray, as was prayed earlier in the, uh, in, in the staff prayer, that this would not just be an intellectual exercise. You want us to love you with our minds. That's one of the teachings of Jesus. But may it make its way to our heart and penetrate there so that we may, be, so that we may become more of what you want us to become and do more of what you want us to do in the world for you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, if we can go to the first slide. Okay, I have to give credit to two people that have influenced me, uh, two, two, of the, uh, two of the people who have influenced me the most in these kinds of teachings. Um, I do that in the name of not plagiarizing, which means taking somebody else's work and getting credit for it. Sadly, see, when I have to grade stuff, I got to look for that. And almost every semester I find it where a student copies and pastes and puts it in their paper and wants to hand it in as if it's their work. Um, and uh, they're in, in my world and unfortunately in the church world, there's lots of verbal plagiarism taking other people's stuff and then saying it, and then the crowd goes, wow, that guy's so smart, but he got it from somebody else, right? Okay, so I gotta be careful not to do that. Uh, the most influential of these two is the one on the left, Dr. N.T. Wright. He's a jolly old chap from England, and he is probably the foremost scholar on the kinds of stuff that I'll be discussing tonight as far as uh, the story of the Bible and approaching it that way. A brilliant, brilliant man humble man, um, known by a lot of theological circles. He looks eerily like my father, who passed away over a year ago, except my dad was, uh, was a fighter from South Philly, and uh, this guy is a, is a nice, jolly old chap, so it's kind of weird to watch him sometimes. But anyway, that's Dr. N.T. Wright. He has, he's probably written, I want to say at least like 60 books, um, so plenty of resources on this kind of stuff. And another man, Dr. Richard Hayes, also very big on this kind of a theological approach to the Bible. Um, I'm also, what's coming to my mind is the professor that I was under most in my training, uh, Dr. Stephen Taylor. <clears throat> so my concentration when I was going for my master's was New Testament studies. But when I was taught, they did an excellent job. Am I too loud? Okay, because I sound, feel like I'm, 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 I don't know, something's hitting me back here while I'm talking. Um, they did an excellent job of showing me, showing us the students, the Old Testament influence in the New Testament, which is what we'll contribute tonight as we look at the entire story. Uh, so I, um, you want to avoid any kind of mentality that says, forget the Old Testament, or it's not as important because we live in the age of grace now, okay? Uh, the old is just as important as the new to see how it all fits together. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the difference between systematic approach and a narrative approach to the Bible. Uh, systematics is what we're used to. Here's what systematic theology looks like. How can we find out about God and justice, the justice of God? So we look in parts of the Bible that will describe that and then pull it out and pull out as, me as much of it as we can and then try to come to some conclusions on that topic. What does the Bible say about the wrath of God? 
his response to sin. Try to look in as many areas of the Bible as possible on that topic and pull it out and deal with it, okay? That's what systematic theology looks like. We have the next slide, okay? But I want you to think about approaching the Bible more as a story. So when I put up this picture, a story comes to your mind, right? This is a classic. Am I, am I fulfilling your stereotype right now, being an Italian from Philly, okay? But this resonates with all of us, okay? So who can tell me just anything? Now, a couple of times I'll give you this opportunity, okay? Don't go turning it into the St. Patrick's Day parade and going crazy, all right? Um, who can tell me, give me some responses on anything about Rocky, the person of Rocky, or anything in the movie? Give me some facts about Rocky, yeah. Huh? He's an Italian, yes. Most important thing, right. He was broke, yeah. Okay, that's good. Yes. Underdog, very good, very good. He loved him some A.D., right? Adrian, very good, very good. You know what? Those are perfect. I'll stick with those, okay? Now, let me ask you this. If you could summarize the, the movie of Rocky in one statement, could you do that? Yeah? Go ahead. Have at it. Victory. <laughs> okay, victory. Yes. But we probably got to get a little more specific. Excellent. Excellent. From underdog to champion. See, because I, okay, so I, I, I always do this exercise, and here's my summary of the movie of Rocky. The underdog fighter who gets a shot at the title and shocks the world. Okay? Never had anybody get that close before, okay? And actually, in one of my classes, one time one of my students heard me say that, and I started to continue, and she says, wait, 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 could you say that again? And she starts writing it down. I said, you don't have to write this down. No, 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 I want it. Could you say it again? And she wanted to write it down. I don't know, okay. You don't have to write that part down, okay? But my point is, everything that somebody mentioned is true about the Rocky story, but also plays its part for the big picture of the statement I just gave you, right? Rocky being Italian is, plays its part in the story of this underdog Italian fighter who goes for his shot at the title and shocks the world, okay? Now, when it comes to the Bible, I want to hope to influence you in the same way, that as you, you may gravitate towards certain parts of the Bible. Some do about God's love. Some do about God's justice. Some do about God's nature or his character, okay? Uh, but what does that thing have to do with the whole story? How does it play its part? Okay, next slide. So systematic theology looks kind of like this if you can see that, those of you in the back, right? That bottom line there, if that's the Bible, these stems coming up from it are the propositions or topics that we might deal with, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of humanity, the doctrine of Christ, or the church, or of the future, and what parts of the Bible deals with those things. But a narrative approach to the Bible, next slide, would look more something like this. We all know what that is, right? The I have a dream speech, and there's a story to that. And there, I just have plugged in different topics in certain areas to give you a, a, a um, sort of a visual aid to see this concept of the part having its place within the whole. Does that make sense? Should I move over? I know I'm not a tall person, but... Say again? Okay. Um, next slide, please. You know what? Back it up. Back it up. Not next slide yet. Well, never mind. Probably too late. Um, 
so I was going to ask if you could tell me what is your definition of the Bible, what would you say? Yes. Louder? God is love. Okay. Yes, sir. Story of man's redemption. Okay. Good. Yes. God's love letter to his people. Okay. Basic instructions before leaving earth. I get it every time. The acronym. Okay. Um, one more. Yes. Okay, God's plan of salvation. Good. That probably comes closest. Here's the definition I want to give for our purposes. Next slide, okay? The story of God's kingdom plan. So, does the Bible have instructions in it? Yes, it does. Is the Bible all instruction? No, right? The Bible deals with um, God's love. Is that all it talks about? No, okay. Now, crazy thing for our culture, even the salvation or redemption of humanity, somebody had mentioned, okay? Very big, actually not the whole story though, though an important part that plays its part in the whole story, okay? Next slide. <clears throat> We're going to look at a few things that, um, that I think will just kind of be fun facts for you. Most of what I discuss will be to bring out the story of the Bible and the concept of it as a story. There will be a few things along the way that may not be terribly important to the story, but I think you might be interested to know, okay? Uh, and this is one of them, which is that the Bible isn't just a book, but actually a collection of books, and the word Bible derives from a Greek term meaning the books or the library. How do you say library in Spanish? Say again. Biblioteca, right? You see the word Bible in there, which derives from the Latin, okay? Uh, and, and same reason we get, so when, when you hold that in your hand, you're holding the library, okay, of the books. Next slide. Now, if the Old Testament is the story of Israel, and that is, that's ancient Hebrew uh, there on the left side, then the story of Jesus is what we could consider the New Testament to be. Okay, story of Israel, Old Testament, story of Jesus, New Testament. And there you have, that, that's what ancient Greek looks like. Next slide. Now, I think that when we think about the Bible, in its totality, we probably imagine this long straight line with these different topics down that road that lead us to the end, okay? Pretty standard way to view it, but I want to suggest that the road of the biblical story looks more like this. Next slide. It is hilly, curvy, with crazy events and twists and turns happening all through it, in which through those things, God surprises the people that he's interacting with in history, with unexpected turns and curves that wind up just being crazy but beautiful. Okay? Next slide. So a, 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 a quick overview of the Old Testament, really quick. The categories are law, prophets, and the writings. And if you, um, on a Hebrew Bible today, in Hebrew on the cover, it will say that that will be the title in Hebrew, in, in, in the Hebrew terms. Law, prophets, and writings, which are pretty much the categories that make up the Old Testament. Next slide. Beginning on the road of the biblical story, back up, we're going to start with creation, 
which is the kingdom of shalom. Anybody know what the word shalom means? Peace, yes, okay? And that's more than just kind of being restful. I mean, it includes that, but the idea is like harmony, okay? A right connecting and flow of things. God's kingdom of shalom and what I'm calling and what has been called by these men that I mentioned, the human vocation. We're going to take a look at, a, a, a big look tonight at the place of humanity, which doesn't exclude everything else that God made, but a certain, a, a certain uh, emphasis on humanity. Next slide. So, do we have our readers? Pastor T, why don't you be the first one? Sure. Over here. Come sit by Pastor Christopher. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, first verse in the Bible. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to read the entire Old Testament and go through it tonight. Okay? But this is the first, first thing you read in the Bible, many of you know. And I just want you at this point to notice there's already a unity between two, heavens and earth, okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This simple statement that we could say backwards is super important to the entire story of the Bible, okay? So that you will get a picture of this by the end of night three, that I'm hoping will make you say, wow. Okay, but for now, let's move on. Next slide. Okay. Another thing that I think might be fun for you, we'll talk a little bit about creation and some views on creation. Because just in our culture, there's a lot of questions about, is the Bible accurate about creation? Does it contradict science? Which one is right? Which one's wrong? If science says this, I'm going to refuse to believe science because I believe what the Bible says. And that whole debate and discussion, okay? But here's a little bit of some perspective just on creation. There's actually a few different views on it within Christian theology, there's the literal seven day, one that you're probably most familiar with, the, the day age theory, and what's called the framework theory. Next slide. <clears throat> the literal seven day, as you I'm sure would guess, is a literal 24 hour day theory in which the creation of the universe occurred over six literal 24 hour days. I say six because what happens on the seventh? Rest, right, okay. There's the day age theory in which each day that's mentioned is viewed as an extremely long age or era of time. So the word day is figurative, not literal, and represents a really thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years, who knows, but a really, really long era of time. Um, an example where the word day is used not in a literal sense, it's more obvious to see, is in Genesis 2, 4, where it says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. How many days did God create? Six. Yet here it says, in the day when God made everything. So that word day is representing in the time when God had made the heavens and the earth. Makes sense? So that when that word day is used in creation, some theological circles Interpret that as not literal days, okay? And then, uh, next slide. This one, the one I find most interesting, actually, is called the framework theory, uh, taken from, uh, at least the information I'm taking at this point, is from a book called um, The Genesis Debate uh, by Lee Irons as the general editor. Uh, it, so this does not have a particular claim on the age of the universe, and that's kind of the argument. Those who believe literal six days say the earth is only, it's a, a young earth is what they say. Very, very young. Those who believe something like the day age, earth is very, very old and more complies with science. This view doesn't really aim to put an age on the earth. Could be young, could be old. We don't know. But really it deals with just the, the literature, the style of the literature 
of, uh, of the creation story, okay? Um, that the events are a poetic framework of linguistic creativity, creativity of language. The basic framework here shows paralleling days every three days. I'm gonna, I'm gonna at least go down here so you could see this because this is, this is good here. And you probably never noticed this and I didn't before checking it out uh, in my studies. Uh, every three days, there's something that parallels three days before. Here's what I mean. Day one, lights were created, right? Or light. God made light as the first thing. Three days later in day four, he made the stars, the lights in the skies, right? Okay, day two, makes the skies and seas. Three days later in day five, the creatures of the skies and the seas to habit or to, to, uh, to inhabit the skies and the seas. Day three, land and vegetation. Three days later, in day six, land animals and humanity who would be resourced by the land. You see that there? Okay. That, that's an indication of the poetic nature of Genesis 1. And Genesis 1 is very poetic. The, the, the story style really doesn't begin until Genesis 2. Okay. But there's a purpose for the poetry in, in, in Genesis 1 that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into. Next slide. Okay. But I just want to point out, the Bible does not reject science. If you look at 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul writes to Timothy, gives him some advice, and says, No longer drink only water, but take a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. For them... They mixed some wine in with their water, and it helped heal some of their stomach issues. He's using science. Now, Paul, if you know much about him, um, he raised people from the dead. He healed many people. Yet he sends Timi Timothy this medicinal scientific instruction. Take some medicine, basically. Okay? But, the Bible's purpose is not to explain science. Instead, its purpose is to give us the story of God's kingdom plan. So, we should probably learn better about what kinds of questions to bring to the Bible. I have to say, I disagree with the idea that the Bible answers every single question we have in life. It's not its purpose. Okay, it's like if you were to think of the Rocky story and think, okay, so Rocky was Italian. Okay, now I'm Italian. So I wonder if he, if he comes from Sicily. Uh, that's where my family's from. Where are Rocky's parents from? What's, it's not in the story. Doesn't matter. It's not, it's not, it doesn't serve a purpose for the story. That's why they don't mention it. Okay? So the Bible is not concerned with how scientifically accurate are we supposed to be on things, how old or how young is the earth. If we were to bring certain questions to the Bible and it could talk back to us, it might say, it's not my purpose to answer that question. My purpose is to give you the story of God's kingdom plan. Make sense? Okay, next slide. So let's hone in on the poetry of the creation story. You can, uh, next slide. Do we have a reader? Volunteer, yes. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, great. I want to play this little four-minute video for you or so to uh, just give you a sense of a very interesting question that all of us might find hard to answer. So go ahead and play that for me. Allie? Hi, Daddy. Hi. What you doing? Listen, um, the other day you, you asked questions about babies and stuff. When you started sneezing? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, anyway, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that now. Okay. 
Good, good. <laughs> Let me try to explain a few things. Okay, here's what happens. When a man and a woman love each other very much, they get married. And then sometimes they decide to make a baby. Why are there babies? Right, right. Okay, I'm going to get to that. <laughs> okay. What a man and a woman do is... No, I mean, I know that the man and the woman have to do something, but... Why are we born? Why has God put us here? <laughs> because that's what? Heaven when we die, then why does God want us here first? <laughs> um, why does God want us here? Yeah, why? Yeah, I heard you. I heard you. <laughs> you don't want to talk about sex? <laughs> you, ever, you ever hear the word fallopian? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, you really want to know why God wants us here first? That's a good question. You see... God is up in heaven, and, well, honey, it's very crowded up there. It is? Y yeah, yeah. And, and you don't want to be in heaven if it's crowded, right? I mean, remember when we went to Disney World, how crowded that was? Huh? I mean, it was fun, but it was too crowded, right? So God, he sends us down to earth for a little while to ease the heavenly congestion. <laughs> what? Parachute! I don't want you to... Punch you. I'll be back in a minute. Well, that's about the best thing us dads know to do when we don't know how to answer a question. Um, so that winds up becoming a real funny episode off of that, where in that entire episode, the whole family starts trying to, like, answer her question, and it gets just crazier and crazier. Um, but is that not a, a valid question? If, if, if we go to heaven when we die, why does God put us here in the first place? You could take a Christian who's been around for a long time, loves God, serves God, and will have a hard time answering that question. Well, I'm not going to answer it entirely tonight, but I'm going to begin to paint a picture, or rather show you the picture that's painted, beginning in Genesis 1, to give us more of a sense of understanding and purpose as to why we are here. And our whole view of eternity. And that has become one of the things for me that as I begin to see things differently, as I've been seeing them lately, has changed so much that has been at the heart of my Christianity. But it's exciting. It's exciting to experience those changes 
out of learning these kinds of things. But uh, I need to get moving here. So uh, next slide, please. Let's just go ahead and, and, and start moving. Okay. Um, so I just sort of want you to notice here. I'm not going to have all this red, okay, but there's going to be a lot of this coming up. And you'll notice if you can see being far enough in the back that certain words are color-coded, okay? Look for similar colors. Those will be the same terms in the same colors. That, at least in the English, begins to show you the poetic nature of Genesis. Now, there's a purpose to the poetry, which we're going to get to, all right? It's when you, under, when, when you can read Hebrew, uh, it, it's more obvious that it's a poem. But I'll try in the English to show you how that's the case. So God said, right, let there be. Those are two different colors. In black, everything that's in black is the detail of that part of creation. Here's what I mean. God said, let there be light, and there was light. So in this part, it's discussing God creating light. Then you have the details of how the light was made. God saw, or the light was good. More detail. There was evening. There was morning the first day. In verse 6, God said, just like up top, and God said, let there be, let there be, as in the previous verse. You're beginning to see that. Then the detail, which is uh, the sky, called the vault between waters, and it was so, God called the vault sky, there was evening, there was morning, second day, just like it says about the first day. Next slide. God said, now he's dealing with the making of the water. There's the detail. It was so. God saw that it was good. Next thing, which is land. God said, let the land, a form of let there be. Let the land produce. Okay, that detail. It was so. God saw that it was good. There was evening. There was morning. The third day. Next slide. Okay, and same thing keeps going. God said, let there be. It was so. God saw that it was good. Evening, morning, fourth day. Next slide. God said, let the water team, a form of let there be. Saw that it was good. Evening, morning, fifth day. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, uh, and then here we're dealing with uh, making the living creatures, the land creatures. Same pattern there. God saw that it was good. Now this is, this, this is part of day six because we'll get to humanity in a minute. Keep going to the next slide. Here I have just most of the details cut out and only the color-coded phrases, which are God saw, let there be, there was, God saw that it was good, there was evening, morning, and then the number of the day that was mentioned. Okay, so you get that. Next slide. Next. Okay, now what we come to is a changing of, of, of sort of the language in the poem, kind of like um, I, I, I compare it to some songs from the 90s and early 2000s of hip-hop, which I confess I'm still stuck in, and I really don't plan on going anywhere, okay? I'm so corny that I have no idea who's out there anymore because I just got to a point where I said, I'm sick of this. I was listening just for information's sake so I can kind of know who was that, and I just got tired of that. Um, so my era that I enjoy is 90s, early 2000s. So who can describe for me what 90s hip-hop kind of sounded like? A lot better, yes, real music. But stylistically, how, what, what, what was the term they had for 90s hip-hop? Miracle. Oh, lyrical. Yeah, lyrical. Music, though, music-wise. Boom bap. Somebody said it? Right, boom bap. Yeah, okay. Why? Because of the steady... Right? And these hard beats that just... You got to watch yourself. Put that stuff in your ears. You walk down the street, you just want to hurt somebody, you know? Um, but the point is steady flow, right? Lyricists used to say, I'm going to lay, they, they do what's called lace in the track, right? Everything just moving, flowing, steady, consistent, but, but uh, you know, something you could just steadily move to. Think of what we just went through as that steady flowing poetry. 
then you might have in, in the middle or, or three quarters of the way through that song a switch up where a DJ, back when they used them, would do something like, and then the beat would change up, right? In this weird, crazy way, they'd call that the breakdown or the break. And everybody's, oh, right? It was unexpected. That's what begins to happen when humanity is introduced onto the scene to say to the reader, pay attention. Something very, very important is taking place Different from the steady rhythm that had just been happening, now something that comes off of that path to make you pay special attention, okay? God said, that's repeated, let us make, not a let there be, but now more of a personal language from the hand of God almost. Let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness. No other piece of creation was described that way. Only humanity. Everything else was good, but this special. Okay? So that they may rule over the fish in the sea, birds in the sky, livestock, wild animals. So God created humankind. Repeated repetition also emphasizes importance. So God created humankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, a couple things to say there, but, uh, man, my time is really going. Um, okay, let me ask you, um, maybe one or two people, how would you say that humanity is in the image of God, like God, unlike these other parts of creation? What, what, what do you think it is that makes us in the image of God? Yes. Yes. Okay. A sense of creativity about us. Okay? Anybody else? Okay. Some debate that. But if it's true, then um, that could be something. Yeah. Able to reason. Okay. So, animals, lion, my favorite animal, right? They feel love for their young. They protect them. But a lion probably doesn't ask herself, why do I feel love for my young one? Right? Human beings can do that. Okay, how about one more? Yes, in the back. Sense of awareness. Okay, maybe the level of the sense of awareness. Okay, I'm sorry. I know there are hands going up, but I really got to move on. Um, how about from here? Well, you put it up on the sides, right? How about from here? Is there anything here that tells us what makes us in the image of God? Say again. Loud. To rule. To rule. Isn't it interesting? All good stuff that's said. All stuff that I've said. But we didn't say what's right there, obviously so that they may rule. I hope at this point you're beginning to catch a vision for what you were intended to be, a ruler. Imagine if people impoverished, addicted, enslaved to things in this life caught that kind of a vision of what God intended them to be. Okay? Catching a vision for how you should be handling your life, how you handle your money, how you handle your wealth, or your health, rather, how you handle uh, your, um, your, your uh, civil responsibilities, how you view justice, what your thoughts are about injustices in this world. All stuff that God has put human beings here to rule with. Now, when we speak of a ruling, we're not talking about a tyranny, right? A dominating kind of ruling. I asked this same question to students, to a group of students one time, and about what does it mean to rule? And 
One student said, well, I guess if I want to take a harpoon to a fish, I can go ahead and do that, right? Now, I'm not saying you can't uh, eat fish or eat meat, right? But when we simply approach it like I can do whatever I want with creation because I'm better than everything else in it is not what God intended. We'll see in a bit, really in Genesis 2, that the idea is that humanity would be good stewards over creation, good managers to ensure that everything is running the way it's supposed to run with the shalom and the peace and the harmony and the flow that God intended to have in life. And that those other beings would actually look at us and say, in a sense, that's my boss and I'm treated very well. I'm nurtured, I get what I need, I flourish because man and woman make sure of that. Okay? So begin to let that sink in. The story is bigger than that. Right? We mentioned the salvation and redemption of man, but this has a, a, a part in the bigger picture. This is a very, very important part. So that they may rule over everything else, and in that, the image of God would be reflected. Last thing I'll point out here is that both male and female were made in God's image. It's not as if the man was made in the image of God and the woman a lesser form. But it's with both, and when both are present and brought together, only then is the image of God most reflected. When one is without the other, something, with, something of the image of God is not in the picture. But when the two are present and brought together, is the image of God most reflected. So there are things about the woman that reflect the image of God that the man doesn't. There are things about the man that reflect the image of God that the woman doesn't. Each are a half, and the wholeness is seen by the togetherness. Make sense? Okay, next slide. But through the making of humanity, what it boils down to is that God demonstrates that he wants a special representation of himself in the earth. That from the Latin term is what's called the imago Dei, representing the image of God. All right, you might recognize some of that just by, you know, if you're Spanish speaking. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so this is more of the same stuff repeated. Next slide. So God takes a rest. Um, you know what, go ahead to the next slide. And the next. You know what, back up one. Okay, I just, uh, so the last thing about Genesis 1 and the nature of its writing the way it's laid out and the way the different parts of creation were made and then with humanity being, being the final part that reflects the image of God in the world is very much um, the way ancient Jews would read this is like the description of the building of a temple. And that's some of what's missing from our reading. Unfortunately, it's, it's in, in some sense nobody's fault. In some sense it is somebody's fault that we don't get enough we don't get educated enough on uh, what the original readers were understanding culturally. So it was like the constructing of a temple. So it's as if the earth was a temple that was being made and the different parts of the creation being created were like the different parts of the temple or what's called the furnishings being put in place. And the thing that takes place at the end of the making of the temple, and this is even for other religions, ancient Near East, that the last thing to be done is an image of the God would be placed into the temple as the final piece, then it was viewed that the God was now living in that temple. And we, humanity, are that image placed into the earth to say now God's, God's presence is officially in his temple. Okay, next slide. Next, we'll come back to this one later. Uh, and next. Okay, so these are some of the things that the Sabbath represents when we deal with that, is that 
as somebody said, it's the Hebrew word for rest. It sets the pattern for God's intended rhythm for life. Okay, once we get to the rest, this obviously wasn't God taking a nap. But the idea of rest was meant to communicate something. The temple language implies that God dwelling in his temple is dwelling in his temple through his image bearers. So in other words, the final piece has been done. Now the temple comes to a place of rest or fullness. God's seventh day rest became the foundation for the Sabbath day of rest in the Jewish law. Some of you might have known. That wasn't just like some good advice. There were serious consequences in the Jewish law if you didn't take a Sabbath every Saturday, okay, which was the end of the week. Um, there was also no other religion in the world that had laws like that that were meant to benefit humanity and the creation. You have to take a rest. You must. Okay? Next, uh, and then the Sabbath is fulfilled in the eternal hope through the gospel, which we'll get to by night three. Next slide. Okay, so we'll get a little into a little bit of the Garden of Eden story. Again, this is where the story form of the, of, of the style begins to, it, it begins now. Next slide. Now here you have this way of describing creation that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, God puts something of himself into that pile of dust that makes it a living being, in this case, the man. The Lord God, now look at this, took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to do what with it? To work it, to keep it, to manage it, to keep it flowing, to keep it running well. Listen to me, Americans, okay? Work is not a result of the fall. Work was meant to be, first of all, it was God's plan for humanity to be working. But the idea was a productive kind of work. That what you would be doing would be enjoyable and it would produce back to you. It would be resourceful. It was productive. Okay? Work was meant to be a part of the plan. Okay? This is before the fall. Um, and then gives the warning about the tree. Now, there are some things you're probably going to expect that I get into or might say, man, but why didn't he get into this or get into that? Um, because they may be parts of the story you already know so well, and uh, I might not find them as being as important to cover for the purpose of the whole story, okay? So something like the tree might not be covered in too much detail for what I'm going to be doing. Okay, next slide. Warns them that when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, in that day or in that time, they'll die. Then the Lord God said, look at this. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. When God was creating everything in Genesis 1, what was described about every piece of creation? That it was good. What's stated here? That something is not for the first time, and yet before sin comes into the picture, for the first time something is described as not good. That the man is alone. Aloneness, isolation, not good. God intended us for community, and he intended for the man and woman to be united. And does something about this problem of aloneness. Next slide takes from his ribs, right? He doesn't take from here or from here, right? But from his side, which for them also was kind of just the torso or a, in a sense the heart. Took from the center of who the man is. If I tell you to point to yourself, go ahead and point to yourself, right? You point right there. You don't point to a different part of your body. God took from there to make the woman. And when he sees her, says these words, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she would be called woman, she was taken out of man. Um, therefore, he'll leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, we all know that, okay? In law problems, right? You know where to go to pull out the Bible. Um, but the point I want to focus on is that they were naked and were not ashamed. Shame was not a part of this picture. 
Now that's going to change, which is kind of the purpose that this is brought up. But at this point, there's no shame in anything that's happening. And in their united, in, in their unity, that is a almost supposed to be an unremovable unity. Okay, next slide. So we go from creation. I don't know if you can see that down there in the corner. Uh, next part of the story is the fall. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, look at a little bit of things here. Hopefully I can get in enough. Um, okay. He, the serpent, said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? What's the first thing the serpent plants into the woman's mind? Doubt. Doubt. Doesn't show up on the scene out of a puff of smoke with fangs down to here. Right? Shows up subtly and just plants a seed of doubt. Did God really say what you're saying he said? Now she gets it right the first time. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the gardens, but God did say, you must not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So you kind of know the picture that's painted there, right? God gives them the garden, gives them the entire earth as their backyard, and says, don't eat from this one tree Human nature being what it is, right? But there's, there's something leads up to that. Next slide. But the serpent replies, you will not surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the light to the eyes and all that stuff to be desired, she took of some of its fruit and ate. What is it that the serpent said to suddenly make the fruit look desirable? And as a result, you'll be like God. How was humanity made, according to Genesis 1? In the image of God already. So you ask yourself, does it tend to be human nature that we're given a certain level of something, but at some point it's not enough? So now it's not just being the, in the image of God in order to reflect God into the world, but now it's becoming like God on a level where we can replace God and he's no longer needed. And that was enough to make her desire the fruit and then want to eat. Next slide. I'm sorry, back up one. Okay, just down at the bottom there. Now all this happens, sin comes onto the scene. It says they recognized they were naked. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths to cover. So what's going on here? Shame. Before all this, before the disobedience, before going outside of God's instructions, they were united and they were naked and they were unashamed. But now as a result of trying to make this move of excluding God, in comes shame. Next slide. Okay. God begins to, in a sense, it says... Uh, Walk in the garden, asks a question, where are you? Does God not know where they are? Okay. Right, so this is a rhetorical question. He's asking, knowing the answer. Next slide. Adam says, I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? What does he say? The woman, right? Okay. That woman, for those of you who got that... I try to put the southern twang on it. Any of you who were raised here, right? That woman you gave me, okay? Now, God goes to the woman. What's this that you've done? What does she say? The serpent, right? It's interesting. Adam actually says to God, 
the woman that you gave me, if you want to blame anybody, you said that she was what I needed, right? She blames the serpent. What's going on here? Shifting blame, right? Sound like human nature? Next slide. So, from God's point of view, all involved are held responsible, okay? Nobody gets off the hook. Now, um, okay, go to the next slide and the next one and the next one, okay? So, the serpent's cursed, says that uh, the woman's seed will strike his head with his heel, right? And, and most of us take that as the eventual arrival of Jesus Christ who will defeat the enemy, right? Um, the woman is cursed by saying your pains in childbearing will be very great. I don't know, ladies, if it was painless before this. Um, it also says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Okay, so now there's not this sense of male and female. And it's also kind of indicating, now don't get mad at me, right? But it's kind of indicating you'll always be seeking to please him, but he'll never be satisfied. And I always get this when I say that. But I, I kind of want to focus on what's given to the man who, who kind of gets the most detailed consequence here. Cursed is the ground because of you. The ground becomes a thing of cursing at this point, and it keeps coming up. I won't bring up every situation, but uh, with Cain, with Noah, okay, the, the, the ground becomes this thing that symbolizes a curse. Uh, it's cursed because of you through pain. Now, look at this. Through painful toil, you'll eat your food all the days of your life. Work was not the curse. Remember how work was supposed to be, productive, fruitful, resourceful, producing back. Now, hard work, little pay. By the sweat of your brow, it says it'll produce thorns for you, and by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food. You'll be working hard just to get what you need and won't get to experience more than that. All of your work will be dedicated to just getting by. Okay. God tells Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 the command to be fruitful and multiply. Now, if I ask what that means, I know what comes up right away, especially from the husbands, right? Have babies, right? So next time your wife says to you, what you doing? I'm trying to be fruitful, right? Don't make me pull out the Bible on you, okay? Um, but it also, in, but in saying that, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, rule over it, the idea is that fruitfulness would also be in what we do and how we rule, and that what we do would produce a lot of positive effect and good, um, good substance in the creation. Now sin turns work into this. Next slide. How much time are you going to give me? What, what, what time is it? 820? 820? That's it? Oh, we're good then. Okay, good. I don't need to be rushing so much. I'm looking at this thing back here, and it's in the red. So I don't know if that's set up for a sermon or what. Mike? Okay. I mean, we actually don't have that much more to go. Yeah, no, that was for Q&A time. That's what it was counting down oh. to, the first one. So okay. then you could go a little bit farther. But okay. okay. Everybody, if you didn't know, like, VBS is going till 9. How many of y'all got kids back at VBS? Yeah, so, I know it. More than half of you do, but so they get out at 9, so we're getting out at 9. So those of you that don't have kids, I'm sorry. Just hang out. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get to some we'll Q&A. We're, so we're almost there. If You're doing that's good. the case, then uh, pass the mic back around. Pass the mic, pass the mic, right? For the readings, people can, okay. Um, so here's God's response. Do we have a reader? Is somebody with a blue shirt? 
The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, angels, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Thank you. Okay, so you have really a couple things going on there. You have punishment, but you also have a level of grace at work there. Because what does God do? He protects them from eating. First of all, he clothes them. Okay, Just something to keep in mind, which will come in later. But you may have read in the New Testament that we have been clothed with Christ. Okay, God clothes them to cover their sin and shame, the sense of shame that they now identify with, and puts angels with waving swords around what's called the tree of life. And the idea was that in one sense, they don't get to eat from the tree of life, which they probably, and this is kind of speculated, but they probably would have been able to had they been obedient instead. So in a sense, that's a punishment, but in another sense, it's they can't eat from it so as to remain in their sinful state forever. Okay, But what results from it the main thing being said here is that they're, 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 they're forced to leave the, the garden banished, banished. And banishment becomes uh, 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 a repeated consequence specifically for sin. So while we're together in these next three days, when you think sin, think banishment, being sent away or sent outside of a boundary, okay? Next slide. So we're actually kind of coming to the end here. So if you got some questions, we should have some free time to do that. Good amount of free time. All right, so let's just review a bit the, the whole event of creation. Starting with elements of the universe, then to the elements of Earth's atmosphere, which are the air, the water, land creatures, and then humanity being the final piece and the climax of that creation and also the piece that in a sense is closest to God because of being made in his image, right? The, the, the part of creation that would reflect him into the world, into the creation. With what humanity attempted by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does that change about this picture here? What does their attempt try to change about this? Uh, it takes them somewhere, but not quite farther. So in reality, that's what it does. But what did they try to do? How does that change this? So in other words, uh, horoscopes is an explanation of yeah. the solar system and the stars. We're using that as a method to get to God without going directly right, to right. God. So almost like a we, we worship you know, the into the atmosphere. New Testament, right? Worshiping the created things rather than the Creator. Absolutely. Romans one, right? right. Okay. We're worshiping the land or the water or the air, right? Right. Rather than so so to answer your question, I guess does it does it reverse the order of it? Right. So academically is right. the way I ask that question. Um, is that a result? Right. That that winds up being the case now. It could be said, yeah. I'm, I'm more asking, um, 
if you go to Adam and Eve specifically, if you go to the man and the woman specifically, right, and what they tried to do, what was their attempt doing for them? What, 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 how does their attempt try to change this for them? They what? Access to... To be more like God. Okay, so how would that change what you see here? It's really simple. It's one of those things that's so simple that we, we don't think of it. Yeah. Yes, next slide. Thank you. To move God out and make themselves the center. To replace God, to be like God on the level that he's no longer needed. Make sense? And thus... In the theological world, and I'm sure you know, many of you would agree, as you're in Christ, that this would be the root of all that's wrong in the world, in the distortion and disharmony that now lacks the shalom that God intended for his kingdom in the world. Okay? Next slide. And I think, right, so we're at our question time. Now, I don't know if you want to... Um, you know, conduct some of this, or, you know, you want me to just take them, you know, you tell me. <clears throat> okay. We'll bring the mic around to you guys if you guys have a question tonight on anything that was discussed. All right. And we got another mic over there, too. Yeah. I was wondering if we have maybe one more person to help. Um, my question is really, it's just kind of a theory question, is when Adam and Eve uh, took the fruit, ate from the fruit of the tree, Adam never apologized. You know, he shifted the blame to Eve, and Eve shifted the blame to the serpent. My thing is, like, um, had they apologized to God and been really apologetic and, and loving and everything like that, uh, God wouldn't have erased their death but it may have erased the sin for us. And because in other parts of the Bible, and I don't remember when, God did forgive the people that did wrong and everything like that. But, you know, sometimes the curse didn't go all the way down. So, I don't know, I just kind of think about that sometimes, you know. They never were apologetic about they did something wrong, and maybe God would have forgiven them, and we wouldn't have been here going through all this. What do you think about that? <laughs> So what do I think about the history of the world? <laughs> no, uh, good question. So when, when, when you factor in where the whole story goes, one of the things that begins to become more and more obvious is that sin has to be dealt with. Beyond the level of kind of just saying, I'm sorry for what I did, because justification, you've all heard that term, to be justified in God. That, that's a legal term. So if, if you, if you kind of put the same situation in a court system, somebody who commits a crime can't just say to the judge, well, I'm sorry I did that, and expect to be let, let free. Justice in the system says you may be sorry. I, like, I, I can't judge whether you are or you aren't. But in the system of justice, that has to be paid for. Right? And... Some of us might even protest and say, how could somebody be let go for committing a crime just because they said they were sorry? God is also described as a judge. So I wouldn't say that if had they said, I repent or I apologize, God would have just forgiven and we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. They probably knew it's communicating something about God and not just the people. It's communicating this God is so perfect. If we do wrong, we got to hide from him or try to hide from him. Now, what does happen is sometimes God doesn't, well, really, up until Jesus Christ, the full, issue, the, the, the full response to sin is not yet issued. Even though sometimes it seems severe, the full issuing is on the cross, which we'll get to. But I don't think 
I wouldn't say that we wouldn't be here had they just apologized. Something has entered into the dynamic of life now that has to be dealt with on a, on a God-satisfying level, which doesn't become realized until much, much later. Does that help answer your question? Um, was, okay. Really? <laughs> okay, I have one question. The Genesis, when you were talking, we about like your voice. A little bit louder. I have one question. <laughs> In the beginning, when you were talking about when God created um, man and woman, and that He said it wasn't good for a man to be alone, so He told He made him somebody, created us. Yeah. And what I don't understand in that part, if God is all good and everything. How did he make something not good before sin? So that, that kind of stuck out to okay. me in this. So good. Yeah, yeah, that's good theological thinking, okay? And that's, you have the freedom to do that, okay? Um, you see something that you feel isn't right. You want to exercise that, okay? Don't hide from that. I wouldn't say it's God created something not good, but it's it, it's it's. That description is building towards something as it's building a story, right? So it's like, take for example the Rocky movie, okay? Um, when he shows up to the gym, at first you see Mickey like treating him like dirt, right? He's go carry this spit bucket, picks up the bucket. The guy sparring says, right, wait a minute. Spit splashes in his face, right? That's not right. But you know that's, that, that's going to evolve into something. That's going to develop into something later in the movie. So the not goodness of man being alone is the story anticipating that thing that's missing. It's just that something's missing. It's that God's not done yet, but he's moving toward the completion. Does that make sense? Is it, or does it not? I mean, let me know. Right, right. Right, right, no, no. So, okay, yeah. It, it's not a, oh, yeah, the woman, right? But it's, it's she, she, she's on her way now. And, and so really kind of meant to emphasize to the reader the beauty of the unity of the man and the woman. Right? Almost as if to say to a man or a woman, um, unless you really feel called, I never felt that calling, so it must be a powerful calling, uh, try not to be alone. Anticipate, look forward to this unity of the other, which will bring a completeness. It will also bring a lot of this, right, because of the sin issue. But, but God wants that idea lived out, um, a reality in, in, in human beings. So I, I guess what I'm really just trying to say at the, bottom, at the bottom line is it's not God missing something or doing something that's not good. It's just the story building toward the goodness and the completion of everything. I have a question for you. Yeah. In light of what you just said, your explanation to her question, would you say that sometimes what, what hinders our understanding or appreciation of the unfolding story is that we have in many cases seen the end already very good very good so we can tend to do what when we already see the end and think you know like we know it well enough take some things for granted versus reading the novel and hearing it saying it's not good right. we not that you're taking anything for granted right but we want to we when we see it unfolding in the novel we keep reading the novel yes. to see what the end result will yes, be. Yes, because, and so, there, there, are, there are historical and cultural reasons for this. Where we are in America and in the western part of the world, Europe and all that, we tend to approach the Bible as facts that can be argued over other facts that contradict it. Okay? But... Before all of that, and in other parts of the world still, they read it like this. Like the way you're watching your Friday night movie. You understand? 
okay? They're, they're, they're soaking themselves in the story and excited about where it's going. Okay, so excellent point. Uh, any others? Yes, over here. Thank you. Um, kind of along in the same, you were saying, a lot of people ask if God is perfect, why would he place that tree in the center yep. and tell them not to eat it? Yeah. Was it necessarily the tree itself or was it the fact that he said don't eat it that caused them, you know, to sin? Because I don't think, it, you know, people say, oh, it's an apple tree or whatever. It doesn't say what tree it is. Does it really matter? It's just the fact that he said not to eat from that specific tree. Right, right. Uh, probably both and. I, I have to be careful. First of all, of course, that question comes up all the time, like when I actually teach this in class. Excuse me. And it becomes a pretty extensive discussion point because people want to know that. Uh, and, and it's good to exercise those questions. If he didn't want it, why did he put it there in the first place? Doesn't he know all things? That kind of thing. Um, it, it, it had to do with the tree because it's described in a specific way as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says, stay away from that. Uh, and what we get specifically from the story is that when the serpent began to make the woman think that that was going to elevate them to the place of, of replacing God, that's when that specific tree became appealing. So in other words, the only thing in their minds that they were missing from not needing God anymore was what that tree was going to offer. So, yes, the tree, because of what they thought it was going to, you know, do for them and, and their nature. But, I, I, now as far as why, I wouldn't, I have to be honest and say I, I, I don't have a, a specific definite answer as to why God put it there. What I usually do is compare it in this way. I've been married 17 years, okay? Some of you longer than that. Should I be... Should I take pride in, a good pride, that my wife has been faithful to me, as far as I know, um, because she's programmed that way, or because while there were other options offered to her, she chose to say no to them? The second one, right? Okay, so if that's the case, is it fair that God would want that out of his favorite part of his creation? And rather than looking at it like, and I know you're not saying this, but some do, dangling the only pleasure available to them on some string and saying, looks good, doesn't it? Uh, uh. Instead, points to the entire planet and says, enjoy. Don't touch this one. Okay? Be faithful there. And there maybe would have had uh, an expression of love that they chose God rather than choosing disobedience. Does that help answer the question? Okay. Any others? Yep. We need a mic. <clears throat> Is there a difference from the beginning of the Bible with the serpent making, uh, well, kind of creating doubt then to the end of the Bible where... When the end time comes and the serpent comes, are we going to decide the right decision? Is that like kind of the same from the end of the Bible to the front of the Bible? Like how the front of the Bible tells you what's going to happen in the end? Right, right. So her question is, um, is what happened in the beginning with the serpent, does that tie in with uh, what to watch out for in the end and how the evil one wants to deceive? Right? Is that the question? Okay. So I, I would have pointed that out when I was kind of skipping through slides because I thought I was running out of time, um, is that uh, just a reference in the book of Revelation, I pulled out real quick, which when it's speaking of the stuff in the end, right, refers to that ancient serpent and then says known as the devil or the enemy. Um, so that's, that, that's kind of the only reference that pretty clearly lets us know who the serpent was. Um, and that, that verse also says that ancient serpent who's in it, like basically saying always trying to deceive. 
So yeah, the idea is it's that same figure out for that same mission to continue to do what was done to the man and the woman to accomplish deceiving makes that the mission, to continue to try to deceive people from what? Away from obedience to God. Okay. Now there's a solution to that, which we just don't get into tonight. Good question. Yep. Oh, um, <clears throat> it, it's a lot, you know, to take in when you, when you from, the, from the beginning. Yeah. But when you first said heaven and earth, there's two, you know what I'm saying, like two entities. And as you read Genesis, it says divide and separate, like, a couple times, like it's, it's hinting, like, as if you, like, when God made man, he knew he was going to make woman. So my thing is, if everything was already set up, and I'm pretty sure because God is the greatest orchestrator, but how, you know, I'm not going to ask how, but my question is, did God have, like, a, a helpmate? Like, that, that's my question. Was there, a, you know what I'm saying? Like, I hate, I hate to say, a, did he have a, 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 a woman? Did he have a, a wife to help him saying, like, hey, this is something that I think this man will be vulnerable in. We can't, can't yeah. leave. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, that's, that's my question because in Genesis, um, I think it's Genesis 2nd. It says us or something like that, and and in yeah. in my Bible don't have any red, but the old Bibles, you know, the Old Testament has like red when God is speaking. So I, you know, what I'm saying I'm curious. So I I don't want to go too, you yeah. know, too far far left, but that's my question. Did God have like a helpmate? So if I get you right, just to make sure I have the question right. Yeah. Is that almost, was God, did he, um, was God the example of having much. a partner joined with Pretty him? Pretty much, yeah. Right? And, and is that the reason there's man and woman, right? Because even God himself yeah. has some kind of partner. Okay, no, good. Fair question, fair question. Um, this, of course, would be a time when I'd introduce the idea of the Trinity, you mentioned the let us, which was in Genesis 1. Now, in the world of theology, um, most of the scholars that I've been exposed to would say that's the first, not clear, but the first maybe subtle, shadowy indication of the Trinity. And there are thoughts of, of other possibilities as to why it says let us make instead of let me make, but uh, most Christian scholars, again, are evangelical, or evangelical simply means those who want to proclaim, right? Evangelicals type of scholars would say that's the first indication of the Trinity. And the concept of the Trinity, as it's studied, boils down to being this. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a continuous, eternal unity that is never broken. Nothing is ever done between them, except one particular thing, which many of you may, may know, right? To break that, they never do anything to each other that conflicts each other within that unity. So in a sense, yeah. It may not be a man and a woman specifically, as if God is a man and another partner is a woman, right? Although, you know, this... This may be unnecessary, but I'll say it anyway. Um, the word spirit in Hebrew is actually a feminine term. Okay? So God is usually in the masculine form. Spirit is in a feminine form. And that could just be communicating a unity that God has within himself. And that's kind of reflected in humanity between the man and the woman. But if we believe the Trinity, which as Christians we do... Um, that, that definitely would be the model of unity, is that God within himself 
is a constant, unified, never broken unity of love that's eternal. Does that help answer the question? I actually got two questions. Um, first question is um, the part that it says that um, God was walking through the garden. I was wondering if that was God himself or Jesus walking through the garden. Yeah, okay. That's actually something I usually bring up in class, uh, but didn't, you know, for time's sake tonight. But God walking through the garden. Uh, that, is that both your questions or is that just the first one? That's the first one. Okay, because that's kind of two questions in itself. Oh. Uh, so, does God walk? Does he stretch? Does he um, bend? Does God do those things? Scared to answer? You could be wrong. If you are, I'll just say wrong. Has anybody ever heard the term, probably the biggest word I know, anthropomorphism? Okay, what is an anthropomorphism? She needs a mic. Wish I could. Can, can, you, can you preach? to something that is not alive. Okay, good, good. Only thing I would change about that, because we're talking about God, is not just something that doesn't have life, but something that doesn't have life like we have life. Because in the word anthropomorphism, okay, we have a Grecian in the room, right? The ancient Greek word for humanity is anthropos. So an anthropomorphism is to give something a human-like quality that really is not human, but it's for the purpose of our understanding what needs to be said. So here's what I mean by that. God walking through the garden. Well, theologically studying the traits and characteristics of God, a lot of theologians would agree God doesn't need to walk because he's omnipresent, everywhere at the same time, all the time. But it's a way in, in telling and developing the story to give human qualities to God for our purposes of understanding what's happening in the story. Does that make sense? Okay. But she gave a great example. Uh, the report says, no, the report doesn't say. So are you an English teacher? <laughs> yeah, that's basically what happens when you go for your education. You get a lot of stuff wrong. Um, a, a report will show. Right? Now, we don't say, hey, a report can't say. You just contradicted yourself. We're used to that. Okay? And that's basically what that part of the story is doing. Now, was it Christ? Um, there's another term perhaps you've heard called the theophanies, which is the idea of the concept that every time God shows up in a way in the Bible, in some way that makes it seem like an angel is showing, or, or in some way that we could picture and imagine a figure that is Christ pre-incarnate or before his birth into the world. Okay, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, showing up. Make sense? Now, whether it is or it isn't, I can't say yes or no, but I can say those are the discussions in my world, that that's possibly Jesus, not called Jesus before he comes in a human body, but possibly Jesus um, before the New Testament. Um, second question. Um, I've always believed, third question, whatever. <laughs> I've always believed that um, before 
uh, we, uh, Adam and Eve, bit the apple, um, there was no other evidence in the Bible saying that we were going to die beforehand until that moment. So if we would have not done that, if she would have not done that, he would have done that, would we actually be living forever? Yep. Um, <clears throat> technically, we don't know if it was an apple. Um, but they ate of the fruit. Um, yeah, it's believed that they wouldn't have. Now, there's some interesting things to that because without going too long, um, some actually believe a lot that I've listened to, that the way Adam and Eve were before them eating the fruit wasn't necessarily the way that they were going to stay. That God actually had in mind development and growth for them. That they would, in a sense, there are ways that they would become better than what they were, even though they were still without sin. And possibly not eating from the fruit and being faithful to what God had commanded would have been a step in that development process. I would say death probably wasn't a part of that, right? But if there was any restriction, it might have been staying the way they were. Um, but once there's disobedience to the instruction, that was the warning. In that day, at that time, you will die. Now, we know it didn't happen that day. In the story, Adam lived some 900 years. Okay. So the idea is that death is now introduced as a result, assuming then that it must have not been a part of the scene before. Uh, and for whatever it's worth, you know, uh, we all, no matter how much death is just inescapable, we all are very uncomfortable with it. Something doesn't seem right about it, right? When you lose somebody, when my father died, I mean, I changed. I mean, like, not just I'm sad, like, I'm at the doctor's office. Something must be wrong with me. I don't feel right. And he's having to calm me down and explain to me, you're in your first year of grief. This happens. Like, physically, I was changing, right? So no matter how much it's there, it's like our systems can't process it. Any others? Over here? Oh man, triathlon. Um, well, I've always, um, sorry if this is. Yeah, I'm sorry, like, okay, we'll go with you next, sir, okay? If this uh, like kind of starts an argument, but, um, I've always been told that if, that because the man is technically over the woman because he is the head of the house, that if it if that technically it was the man's fault. So th that I, that it was technically his fault because of the fact that he was over the woman. Didn't right? you read the story? <laughs> this woman you this woman you gave me. Yeah. So, um, you know, right, right, right. Right, right, right. So yeah, yeah. That 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 that's a, that's. So that's a common question that comes up: whose fault was it because of, um, because of the roles that they were in, or were they in those roles? Right. In a sense, right. So, um, just a second, sir. Um, so. Those questions come up because of where we're at in our culture. Now, this is where I have to refer to the Bible's purpose and say it's really not trying to answer that. It's not really dealing with that. The main point that it wants to make is that they both disobeyed and both suffered their consequences. So um, you could blame each other and maybe both be right, or shake hands and say, we're both wrong. And then be fruitful and multiply when you make up. Uh, there was a question over here I needed to get. Keep your hand up, sir, just so he could. Yeah. Uh, before they sinned, they were both equal. That's why Adam didn't knock the apple out of 
uh, Eve's uh, hand. That's because because he had no Adam had no rule of, rule or authority over Eve because they're both equal. That's the, you said he knocked the apple out of Eve's hand. Yeah, I mean I I I I heard preachers say that that Adam should have knocked the apple out of Eve's hand. Well, others have said well they're both equal. That's why they're both yeah. the same. I didn't see that part of the story. Yeah. Bang! Get yeah. out of here, yeah, woman. I, I, I've heard that. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, but there is, there is the picture of equalness there and both needing each other in order to reflect the image of God. Now, we see more in the New Testament these roles given to the man and the woman where Ephesians 5, the husband is the head of the wife just as Christ is head of the church, right? And I'm not necessarily against those roles, but the point there is the way bo both are supposed to love each other that when it's done, right, when, when that unity even if, if if the man in a sense has an authority that the woman doesn't have on that level in the relationship as soon as he say, as soon as he tries to uh, abuse that authority he's automatically wrong and sinning he's automatically sinning because he tells the man also to love the wife in the same way that Christ loves the church so he should good lord i'm convicting the mess out of myself right now he should be saying to himself, I'm angry at her. I want to say this or I want to do that. But would Christ treat me that way? If not, then I can't do that. Right? So, um, again, you get that picture more in the New Testament. And his job really is to treat her as an equal. Right? She should always be made to feel like one. Um, hope that answers your question. Over here, yes. All right. Um, my theory, right? I'm not. I'm new to all this. Yep. <laughs> and um, I keep hearing that Adam is the blame, right? <laughs> but from my understanding, the female ate that fruit. She ain't tell him where that fruit came from. From what I hear, she ain't tell him none. She just said, "Here, eat some fruit." <laughs> so my thing is, how come Adam is getting the blame? Like when she, when every month she gets her friend or whatever. I tell her, you need to holler at Eve because she's the one that bit the fruit. <laughs> so. Well, you just never know. How about I just begin answering the question right there? You need to go get a drink of water or something? It's okay, I understand. So, um... You mean that good friend, right, who shows up at the house to hang out with her, right? Yeah, I know that. My wife has well, a good friend like that. It's so, right. of, um, so, so, yeah. um, <laughs> because they're given consequences, right, because they're given consequences, that's communicating they're both at fault. So, and, and so this is part of the issue. We want details that the story just doesn't give us. Something in us wants to know which one was wrong. So even today, we could say, this woman that you gave me, right? It all started back here, okay? But because they were, now remember, this is God giving the consequences. Just imagine, God doesn't have to be told, okay, now what happened now? You know what, my mistake, it's really her fault. I got the story wrong. No, God knowing what God would know, which is everything, knows to respond to both with consequences, therefore both being at fault. So without saying it, it's kind of saying he knew what fruit he was eating. He knew what fruit he was eating. Make sense? But don't feel, you know, shy about being new to all this. I just finished a class where the first day of class, one student said to me, just to let you know, I never read the Bible. Or I said, hey, don't even sweat that. Matter of fact, I'd rather you that way. Uh, because then you're not coming with all these preconceived things. Are we done? Or will we take one more? Or Yep, we got time. So, got to cut it, right. Can I take one more? Or No, okay. I'm sorry, I think I may have to cut it. But listen, some have to pick up their kids. There's a bigger picture to think about with things that have to get done here. I'll be up here if you have more questions, okay? And we'll do part two tomorrow night. Bless you all. Had a lot of fun. Everybody stand up. We're going to pray. Tell them real quick. T tell them just like in a 30-second snapshot, what are we talking about tomorrow night?
Yes. Uh, so tomorrow night, we're, gonna, we're basically going to deal with the rest of the Old Testament story. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to go from the key figures that focus on the story of Israel and who are the people of God of the Old Testament and why is there a people of God and then how it turns out, how those people turn out before Christ shows up on the scene. All right. Give it up for Tom one more time. And we're going we're gonna to have a meeting tonight, and we're going to have the answer for you tomorrow night if it was Adam or Eve's fault. So, you know, come back. We're going to have that figured out for you by then. <laughs> He'll deal with that on Sunday. I won't be here. <laughs> You're going to be here Sunday. All right. Hey, we're going to pray. So grab your neighbor's hand real quick. We're going we're gonna to pray out tonight. God, we, we love you tonight. We thank you for your love. And for your love letter to us, the story of the scripture that you've given to us from Genesis to Revelation, it all flows together. A lot of us have never maybe looked at it like that. Uh, we always want to get to the end, and but, but there's a beautiful story in God. So I pray tonight as we kind of covered a lot of the beginning part uh, that, that many of us will make it our business to be back here tomorrow night to, to hear the rest of the Old Testament story. And then Friday night we're going to get into... Uh, the New Testament story, the Messiah, Jesus, and, and how all that unfolds, God. So we love you. Um, God, be with our kids. We thank you for what you did tonight. May we have some good discussions and conversations with them, those of us that have kids on the way home and tomorrow, and uh, continue to do your thing this week. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. We love you guys. Have a great night. Tone's going to be hanging up here if you want to holler.